Week six, we're talking waivers. It's actually kind of a fun waiver week. Last week was shitty behind our number one option, Jaleel McLaughlin. McLaughlin, I don't know if we've ever had confirmation on what his actual name is. Regardless, he was the number one guy, performed like it, good player, good ball player. We've got a bunch of those types of players on the waiver wire this week. We've got a bunch of key injuries. We've got some more bye weeks, so we will jump in. We'll get right to it. We'll tuck our jackets. All the way in. Get it. If you're new here, welcome. What we do for our waiver wire videos is jump into Sleeper. We jump into the trending tab and we talk about the guys that are most notable this week as well as the guys that are probably most droppable. This is so disrespectful that Michael Wilson is sitting there as one of the most dropped players. You shouldn't drop him. We told you to pick him up. But we told you not to start him, all right? He is still someone that you want on your team. But the Arizona Cardinals, again, provide us with one of the top guys this week. And if you want just simple waiver wire rankings, those are live right now on bdge.co. Every single week we rank every player, positional, flex, how much fab we would spend on each player. So the rankings are up there for our big dog members on bdge.co. But let's talk about the trending tab over there. We've got Amari DiMarcado, who is the backup for James Conner. Now, James Conner's dealing with a minor knee injury. Most Twitter doctors are saying that they'd lean towards James Conner not playing in week six, but does not seem to be a super long-term problem. Amari DiMocato has started to play the backup role to James Conner uh, since Keontae Ingram has been out. Now, Keontae Ingram might be returning to practice soon. And I think at this point, the Cardinals have shown absolutely no inkling to play Keontae Ingram uh, regardless. I don't think they think he's a good player, so it feels like they feel comfortable with uh, Amari DiMarcado, who was the backup to Kendra Miller at TCU, but he is uh, a relatively ex explosive athlete. He's a dude who ran a sub 4 5 40 at 215 pounds, so he could be a James Conner replacement for at least a week, so I'm not going to blow my whole budget on it because when James Conner is back, he is the workhorse, right? As much as we have tried to say that it will eventually stop the last four years. It just never does. So when James Conner's back, he is the back, okay? So uh, Amari DeMarcado is probably the number one running back pickup this week if you need an immediate fill-in. And I'd probably drop somewhere between like 8 and 12% on him. Breaking news, what else is new? Literally five seconds after I hit finish on recording that video, we had news come out about James Conner. He's now slated to miss multiple weeks. He is also a possible IR candidate, which ups the ante for Amari DeMarcado. Now, I know a lot of y'all thinking, sneaky, sneaky, throw a couple dollars on Keontae Ingram and see what happens. And I would agree with that. I think that is definitely uh, a path that you can go towards. But I do think that Cardinals team has showed you that they do really like Amari DiMarcado. And I think that even before Keontae Ingram got hurt, DiMarcado was starting to play more snaps than him. And then when James Conner went down last week, he was the guy. He became the every down player. He was doing two and four minute drills, long down and distance, short down and distance. Again, 215 pounds, a dude who runs a sub four, five, 40. He is just as interesting to me right now as Roshan Johnson is. So between those two guys, those are my top running back pickups of the week, probably my top overall pickups of the week. If you are looking for running back help and DiMarcado now becomes a dude that I would probably throw upwards of the 12 to 15 percent range for fab dollars on maybe more if you really really need to to you know bolster that fucking lineup of yours right now which I do on many of my teams I might be throwing somewhere between 15 and 20 percent on him and hoping for that upside in an offense that's performing a lot better than we expected so needed that update for you I know you guys would be screaming at me in the comments so here you go if you look at the Chicago situation right we have Deonta Foreman here, and we have Roshan Johnson down here. And the reason that he's so far down is because Sleeper lists them and ranks them by pure volume of number of pickups. Roshan was obviously more owned than Deonta Foreman, so more people could pick him up. Now, what we're dealing with with Khalil Herbert is a high ankle sprain. So in your mind, you should just chalk Khalil Herbert out for basically four weeks. Roshan Johnson also got concussed in this game that they just played. Now, because they played on Thursday night, he now has a few extra days to clear the concussion protocol to play against Minnesota, which fantasy running backs tend to score a lot of points against. For the most part, I would say at like a 70 to 80% clip, if you have a concussion the following week, you are going to miss that game. And then usually cleared by week two, but every concussion is a little bit different. Some people got huge brains. Some people got very small brains. It's going to impact you a little bit more than it'll impact me, you know? So if C4 sponsored us, I would have the illest ad reads of all time right there talking about brain power oh, 
That being said, the extra few days is going to be huge here because I think that percentage likelihood of him missing Roshan Johnson next week's game creeps down probably like 10 to 15% each day that passes by. I would keep a close eye on it. Here's the more important thing to really think about. While you might say, hey, Deontay Foreman is going to be the cheaper guy on the waiver wire. I mean, Roshan Johnson's probably much more highly owned. The Bears have told you what they think between those two. The Bears have told you who they like better, who they think is more talented, and who is better for their fit and their system. Clearly, Roshan Johnson. Deontay Foreman has been a healthy scratch for the last like three weeks. Johnson has taken over as the backup guy. So we should assume that that's the case going forward. If he misses time, Deontay Foreman is going to be a, a pretty good plug and play because their running backs just tend to get a lot of touches overall. Like at the end of the at the end of the game, the running backs get anywhere from like twenty to twenty five touches collectively, and that will almost all go to Deontay Foreman. And this is a Chicago team that's starting to get their shit together. So when I when I look at this, I want to ro- I want to own Roshan over Deontay Foreman, and Roshan would be up there with uh, Amari DeMarcado and probably even above him because Roshan, there's a chance he goes in as the top guy for this week and the next three weeks while Khalil Herbert's gone and just retains that role. Khalil Herbert has played well, but again, outside of elite running backs that are on like their second contracts, momentum is massive for running backs in the NFL. Like three, four game windows matter. They could be the difference between you being the starting running back for a team for the next two years and being the backup. Like I know that sounds dramatic, but that's really how the NFL works. Outside of like the top five, six guys, again, who get that second contract and who are elite talents the window for you being the guy in a backfield teams don't give a fuck man it's it's really next guy up mentality and that's where Roshan Johnson could be in so Roshan's a dude that I think thinking about it more now I would probably throw him above Amari DeMarcado if you are in a league that has him available but he's 48 percent owned so probably not widely available uh Roshan would be the number one guy for me right now and I would I would throw upwards of like fifteen to twenty percent on him I think if I need a running back Deontay Foreman is another guy that I would you know I, I think he'll get his, he'll get some work as well and I think they'll split the committee there if they're both active I would throw somewhere between like five and eight percent on on Foreman and kind of just see how that backfield plays out while Khalil Herbert is gone you want to talk about having a running back gone we got to talk about Devon Achan it was something I brought up in the stream yesterday every Monday I do a game by game recap stream. So if you are not subscribed to the channel and you don't have notifications on, get to it. Get to stepping. The notification button is right down below, right next to the subscribe button. We went game by game, and when we got to the Miami team, I said I hadn't heard anybody talk about Devon Achan's injury, and I think there's something there. And then we heard today that he's going to be out multiple weeks with a knee injury. So what does that mean? Raheem Mostert goes back to being the one, obviously. Jeff Wilson was on the IR, right? Missed the first four weeks, missed the first five weeks, and... I I don't really know what to make of the situation because we talked about it in last week's stream where Mike McDaniel's comments in the summer about Jeff Wilson were weird, right? They were like, um, yeah, I I think that we'll probably see him again this year. Kind of eerie, kind of kind of weird, bad vibes there. And the only one we heard like positive vibes from were was uh, Drew Rosenhaus, who was Jeff Wilson's agent, being like, yeah, he'll be ready for week five. Wasn't ready for week five. They chose not to open the 21-day practice window for Jeff Wilson last week. Now they are pushing, obviously, to have him back at practice this week. I'm just, I'm just gonna say, like, again, I think there's something weird going on here. I don't know if Jeff Wilson is gonna be healthy or active this week, so I would keep a close eye on practice reports. Obviously, he needs to be owned in every uh, league because Miami is just so fruitful when it comes to fantasy points out of the backfield. I still think it is very much Raheem Mostert's backfield to lose right now at this point, but there could be a, a chance that we get to, you know, next week or two weeks down the line, if A-Chan is still out, that Jeff Wilson is getting 40% of the touches kind of thing. I, again, I, I just still think coming off of a very long injury and uh, all this kind of shit, like a lot of a, a lot of moving parts that need to go right in order for Jeff Wilson to like really, really return fantasy value for you in your lineup. So so I'm, I'm not blowing a whole lot of money because I think if Jeff Wilson is back, but they're at full strength, I still think the pecking order is going to be the Chan, Mostert, tear break, Jeff Wilson. So Jeff Wilson's a guy, you know, I would throw five, seven percent and kind of see how it shakes out. Other than that, I don't think these other running backs are really worthwhile talking about. Tajay Spears should definitely be owned, but this is the same conversation we have every single week. Zach Moss is already highly owned. McLaughlin's very highly owned. Obviously needs to be owned. Yeah, no other real running backs to speak of. So let's switch things over to wide receivers. Justin Jefferson is going to miss four weeks. He got placed on the IR, so it's a minimum of four weeks, which means they are down to KJ Osborne, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson. I don't even know who their third wide receiver is. Can't be Jalen Rager. It's bad, whoever it is, which means that KJ Osborne is going to slide into an every every down player. So is Jordan Addison. Finally, you could start Jordan Addison every single week, but I also think KJ Osborne is 
an every week starter as well. It's almost like an upgraded version of Joshua Palmer, right? Like we really like Joshua Palmer. We liked Quentin Johnson, obviously, as pickups last week. And I think Quentin Johnson, who is probably relatively highly owned, if he is available or if someone dropped him after a bad bad game last week, he would actually be like my number one pickup on the week because a lot of the times what happens is we see a huge post by rookie bump. This is what happens with rookies, especially first round rookies, where they need a little while to get uh, acclimated to the offense and get more snaps and get a bigger role. They have the buy, so they have two weeks to prepare and get them more settled, and then they kind of break out and do better over the second second half of the year. So Johnson would be a top, top target this week. But behind him again, KJ Osborne is someone that, I mean, he hasn't been great, but like Minnesota has shown that they love this kid. For whatever reason, they cannot take him off the field. You see these snap percentages here, 91, 97, 93, 83, 89. Now with Justin Jefferson, off the field, he is going to play basically that role. I think they came out and said today that like KJ Osborne is going to play the X role. Is he going to be as effective? Absolutely fucking not. But he's probably going to see eight, nine targets a game. If you're in a PPR league like this one is, you could see, you know, 12.4, 10.6, 9.9. Those are the types of performances you want as bye week fill ins during this time of the year. This week we have Green Bay on a bye and we have Pittsburgh on a bye. So we've got Green Bay and we got Pittsburgh. If you guys, have any of those players on your teams, then you need to start thinking ahead and thinking, hey, we might be down in the depth a little bit. We might be down the dumps a little bit. We need to start getting things to click. So KJ Osborne's a dude that like, he's probably my, one of my, if not my top targets on the waiver wire this week, just from a pure volume standpoint in that Minnesota offense, Kirk is throwing for a shitload of yards. Obviously it's kind of a chicken or the egg, probably a lot to do with having Justin Jefferson to throw the ball to. But this is a team that's consistently trailing. This is a team that's throwing at an extremely high rate. They're not getting any success from their running back. So they're kind of forced into that. I think this just means that the target funnel is going to be extremely condensed between Hawkinson, Osborne, and Addison. And I think you could fire up all those guys in your lineup any given week for the next four weeks. So again, the waiver wire rankings in particular, like how how much I would spend on him and like where I have him ranked relative to the other guys at his position – will be part of the membership bdge.co go cop that right now but i was warned to dude i would shell out for like i you know anywhere from eight to like 15 percent, i'd be cool with curtis samuel's getting a little bit hot right now he's still just like a dude that i don't trust in my lineup but more often than not he's doing well you're talking about back-to-back weeks of 18 plus ppr fantasy points no one else is really getting it done in that offense from the passing perspective like Jahan dotson has been a fucking absolute disgusting blemish uh, in my life right now. Uh, Curtis Samuel has been the opposite of that. He's been very, very, very good. So he's someone that I think you could kind of throw into your lineup because they're getting him involved. They're using screen passes for him. They're getting getting him open down the field. But the pass catcher I really want in Washington is Logan Thomas, man. He is now back at full strength running the full slate of routes. You could see in week one, 82% of the routes, eight targets, four for 43. Week two, very limited role, got hurt. Still caught a touchdown, though, so ended up having a good fantasy day. Came back from the injury, 79% of the routes, 3 for 41 is okay, but in today's standards, that's kind of fantastic. And then again, Chicago, 11 targets, 9 catches, 77 yards, and a touchdown. You're talking about 25, that's tight end premium, so probably more so uh, around like the 20 mark, but that is fantastic for a dude you can kind of just pick up. He's had his spurts of like really, really high productive fantasy stretches, and it feels like Logan Thomas is kind of playing that Travis Kelsey role in the BNME offense. So Thomas would definitely be my top tight end pickup of the week and would rank a lot higher than a lot of these skill players right now. So Logan Thomas is a dude, if you need a tight end, I would easily shell 8 to 10% of my fab for him. Of course, we cannot forget about some super flex action. We've got Anthony Richardson out for quite a while, which means Gardner Minshew is going to fill in. He's been filling in great um, in the limited role that he has had this week. He's had basically three games of, Real impact work here, Houston, Baltimore, Tennessee, and he's been really good in all three games. So if you're in a super flex league and you need a quarterback, Minshew's a dude that you need to be targeting because Anthony Richardson's injury, yes, it could be four weeks. It could be something that lasts up to eight weeks, if not lingering for like the rest of the actual regular season. So Minshew could end up being like a sneaky, really good. I mean, I don't know if I want to say like really, really good, but in the same sense that you, you know, you have to draft Sam Howell as like a ninth round pick in super flex leagues. You just kind of grab Gardner Minshew off the wire for that same price. So Minshew is a dude that you definitely need to attack if you're uh, quarterback needy in super flex. For instance, you know, you have Pittsburgh and Green Bay on a buy. Maybe you had Jordan Love and Kenny Pickett as your QB 2-3. Gardner Minshew is a dude that you definitely want to attack and you definitely want to be throwing heavy fab on him somewhere from you know the 12 to 20 range, if not higher than that, depending on how desperate you are. I also like 
one of his top options in Josh Downs, who's seeing really, really consistent playtime, hasn't had a single week below 70% of the snaps. Now, this will come and go depending on their defensive matchups. Like Tennessee is a terrible pass defense, so of course he ate them up a little bit. Jacksonville, you can definitely get it done in the slot against them, so this is kind of a good matchup for him. I believe Alec Pierce also missed last game with a concussion, and that's probably a lot of the reason why the targets were kind of condensed down to Josh Downs, but he's a good pickup this week for a bye week feeling for sure. No one else really interests me. Dalton Schultz had a big game, but that a lot of that just came off the back of uh, Tank Dell and Robert Woods getting hurt. Robert Woods, not a terrible pickup because Tank Dell likely misses next week just based on the concussion averages. Who else? Josh Reynolds, he's over 50% owned. Rashi Rice should definitely be uh, looked at. They play on Thursday night. Travis Kelsey did miss the first practice of the week on Monday, so it's possible he misses versus this really shitty Denver defense. I get it. Like, I don't know. Rashi Rice is kind of like bopped around in waiver wire videos, but he, his snap percentage is still really low. 31, 18, 51, 46, 30. We're like, we're not really seeing that bump in terms of play time. And again, this might be a situation where, I mean, they use a second round pick on him. They really like the kid, obviously, but this could be like, again, a post buy type thing where Rashi Rice really, you know, he starts to see his maybe has a good game against Denver. They actually have four really fucking good matchups. Denver, LAC, Denver, Miami. Maybe we do want to go a little bit more in on uh, Rashi Rice. Anybody else on this side that we want to be targeting? Not really. Everything else looks disgusting. Let's move over to drop candidates. Matt Breda, you could drop with Saquon coming back. Uh, we're not dropping Michael Wilson. Don't ever disrespect me like that. Marvin Mims, again, again, he's kind of like a luxury ad. He's kind of just like a luxury uh, piece that you hold on to because everybody just keeps saying they're going to trade away their wide receivers or they have to do something different. Clearly, Sean Payton is telling you that he doesn't have to do something different. He's okay losing and giving up 70 points. He's okay being the worst team in the fucking NFL right now. So maybe nothing does change with Marvin Mims, but, you know, you can hope. Jaden Reed's on a bye, so I guess he's kind of droppable for the time being. I still think he's a really good player, but with Christian Watson back, he obviously takes a hit. Wando is kind of interesting for PPR. He just ends up with the same fucking stat line every week. He catches five balls. Sometimes it's for 20 yards. Sometimes it's for 50 yards. You could probably do better. Cook was droppable fucking a month ago. Dobbs, I definitely would not drop. Gainwell, I mean, he's getting work, but he he literally has no upside. He never did. That, that first week, he got 18 touches and ended up with 11 PPR points. The guy's trash. Tutu, I would hold on to just because that offense is going to have big games, and he's eventually going to be a beneficiary of that. Gus Edwards, I would hold on to. Josh Kelly is definitely droppable with Eckler coming back. Latavius Murray was never really, like, playable. They were just hoping for a touchdown. Dalton Kincaid, as much as this fucking kills me, yeah, he's he's likely droppable. Sky Moore, I would hold on to, again, just on the fact that Travis Kelsey might miss. And if that's also the case, then we have to look at the tight ends for Kansas City. So if we jump over to FantasyLife.com, this is a free resource to use. You could see in week one when Travis Kelsey missed, we had Noah Gray running 82% of the routes. Blake Bell down at 24%. So you could do worse than having Noah Gray in there uh, as your tight end if Travis Kelsey misses against Denver. And if you look at Denver jumping over to the 33rd team, they have this free resource called the Edge over there. If you look at Denver, obviously they're just terrible all around, giving up the second most points to QBs, but also giving up the six most points to fantasy tight ends on the year. So again, good matchup, decent player. It is what it is, what it is. Cam Akers, I would hold on to again. Uh, that backfield continues to be more and more split each week that goes by. Well, is there anyone else that we can talk about? I think you could probably drop Brandon Cooks. Kind of want to hold on to Rashid Jaheed, as you can see. I am holding on to him just because Derek Carr is clearly really banged up. But I think when he's healthy, he becomes like a really, really big part of that offense. Jameson Williams, you're definitely holding on to. Tank Dell being on the drop list is insane. Bourne droppable. Odell droppable. Jahan Dotson, again, I want to say uh, Matt Harmon, who does reception perception, has actually done some in-season charting. And he's looking at players and, you know, how well they fared through the first few weeks. And Jahan Dotson is still as highly ranked on in that resource as he was in the preseason. He's still getting open all the time. It's just not happening for him. So I get it. If you want to drop him, I'm personally probably holding on to him through bye weeks in case I need to throw him into my lineup. But I get it. He hasn't done shit for you. Probably won't ever do shit for you. I hope this video did some shit for you. And if it did... Please hit the thumbs up on this down below. You'll see it looks like this. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button because we're going live multiple times per week to recap the games, all that sheesh. And make sure you go sign up for the waiver wire rankings, bdge.co. 
Become a Big Dog member. Waiver wire rankings, weekly rankings, private Q and Assault live stream on YouTube where you could ask me any of your sit star questions every single Saturday. I'm out of here. I love you. Thank you. Get wild. Get wild.